Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Behind the Couch. It feels yes. like it's been a long time since our last one, but it hasn't. I mean, no, we, we talked with Frank last month. I don't, okay. it, it might have been more towards like the beginning of the month, but this feels so appropriate because, gosh, like to a day and a half left of March. And here we are giving you one last thing before we go on sabbatical. <laughs> Our six week sabbatical that we're yeah, really looking forward weeks. to. Exactly. Oh my God. Yeah. I was, I had dinner with Dr. Amy from Women in Crime. She was out here for a conference and actually she and Megan are going on sabbatical later this year. So, but they have to, I think, work on a project for their school that they work for because they're in academia. But I was like, that would be amazing to just step away from my job for six to nine months. And okay, I'll work on a yeah. little side project. I'm how does that I'll leave of absence that. thing work? Does that is actually <laughs> doing that every week anyway? I know, I know. Yeah, that would be really, really nice. What I want to do is I've always dreamed about being a Fulbright scholar and getting mm. that scholarship and going somewhere abroad for six months to a year and bringing something back to the workplace. You know, so sort of same thing, sabbatical ish. You're just in a different country. That would be fun. That'd be great. Yeah. So you guys, welcome back. We also have so many new Patreon members, which has been really exciting. Just, I'm not even really sure where they emerged from, but we really <laughs> appreciate you showing up and coming back too. So we wanted to address our new members, get monthly gifts to our new Patreon members. At the associate level, we welcome Hannah L., Jarna J., Amy S., Amanda M., Janny Banani, Andrea R. And at the intern level, we have Nadia, Jen, Alexis F., who came back. Thank you, Welcome Alexis. Back, Welcome. Alexis. Welcome. Yes. And then with just kind of the new year starting up, I completely forgot to do our drawings for our doctoral level folks. So at the beginning of the year, it starts over. So everyone who's at the doctoral level gets put back in the pot. Of course, like as you win each month, we remove your name. So other people just have a chance to win, but I have our first three winners of 2024. So for January, we have Carrie F. So we are going to be sending everybody a prize and I already checked, make sure your addresses are on there. February, we have someone who is under two names as their, their username and Patreon, but it's Kalia and Sasha. And then for March, Laura E. So we will be in touch with you guys on Patreon, social media, however we can, you know, bug you to make sure that you know that you won the giveaway for the first three months of 2024. So we will figure out some fun things to send you guys. We have lots of time to think about it. I'll get them all out at once. So congrats guys. Congrats. And thank you guys also for wh whoever, whatever, stream we ended up showing up on has increased <laughs> more reviews coming in and yeah, they're always so appreciated I, of course you have to shiloh has to hide the negative reviews from me <laughs> i'm like i'm okay i'm okay i can handle like it but this is we wanted to share a couple with you which you know it sounds self-congratulating but it, it really is a very validating experience for us as media content producers at this level you know runner wine girl says this type of psychology is fascinating, and these two professionals are just that, professional and so knowledgeable. The podcast makes me use my brain, and I love it. I, I can't think <laughs> of anything. That's a um, higher – It's that was my experience of going back to grad school as a returning adult is just feeling those neurons mm -hmm. starting to crackle again. So if we, can, if we can help with that and still make it fun and snarky, then all the better. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So there's – we had another five-star review in March. I want to read that one as well. So it's from the only Zane who says this podcast takes a different look at crime, looks at the psychology of the crime criminal rather than your typical who did it and why. However, what I really like about this podcast is how fair they are when talking about religious communities. They have a few episodes where they call out the problems and crimes that happen in the Christian, Catholic, Muslim, et cetera, communities without mocking, generalizing, or being disrespectful. It's definitely something that needs to be talked about more, but they do it in a way that is still respectful of other people's beliefs. Really appreciate that. Um, Highest compliment ever. I mean, that kind of insight. Thank and you. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. We appreciate we're, it. You know, we're, I mean, we're, we're confident in the research that we do, 
but we also get like, oh gosh, we don't want to hurt anyone's feelings or push really sensitive buttons. And, you know, I think a byproduct of what we talk about every single week, no matter what, if it intersects with mental health, that it's likely going to be sensitive to someone. So feedback like that helps. It really, really does when we are considering topics. So I'm going to do something right now. I'm going to bring our guests on okay. and make them wildly uncomfortable while <gasps> we sing their praises. I probably okay. sometimes we'll de- we'll like, oh, they might feel a little awkward. So let's introduce them before they come on. But I'm going to put my dear, dear friend and hopefully a new friend and Nan and get to meet her today. I've known Steve for years and years and years. Just absolutely stand up. Wonderful guy. We're going to let them in. And let them okay. roast over the introductions and accolades. Let them know what the plan is. <laughs> Welcome to being tortured on our live stream. <laughs> Let's see. Are they going to be together? Which would be oh, really oh. cool. Yes, it would be. Hello. Where are they? They're hiding from us. Hi, guys. They're hiding behind there the Hollywood are. sign. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> Let me just can you hear us? The... We, can. we can. We're just yeah. looking for your camera. There ah, we go. There we go. Hang on. We're we just didn't start our video. There. Hi. Boom. There you go. Oh, let me just change our little name here because it's not Nan McNamara. <laughs> <laughs> I see you. You wanted us together. We're together. We deliver. Oh, oh my, gosh. my goodness! It's so good to see you. I haven't Steve. I haven't seen you except in photos online in years so it's really good to see you i told cam i i think michael and fred's wedding was the last time i've laid eyes on you oh my gosh mate no well i think you may have Have i seen you since i think you may have come to our near new year's thing once since then although i I missed a couple though because uh, for other reasons but i don't know that i've seen you since their wedding probably not but well it will not you got yes, you guys just stand us up every year. We weep because oh. <laughs> we have so many holiday obligations that get in the way. But hold on, I'm going to make them supremely uncomfortable because I want to. I want to jump right into the welcome and the bios. Welcome, Steve Cubine. He is the co-host of the wonderful podcast from Beneath the Hollywood Sign. I already apologize to you for messing up your <laughs> algorithm because I've been marathoning all of your episodes over the past three days. So oh, hopefully all goodness. of our listeners will as well. We love uh, it. Steve has a resume of an entertainment pedigree that could literally take half the show to explore. And I want to do my best to give you all a picture of who he is. Steve is an award-winning writer-producer of the 2018 Primetime Emmy Award-winning series Break a Hip that's still available on ri- online, right, Steve? Yes, yes. Okay, Amazon. please go watch it. It's fantastic. He's also involved in the cult classic film adaptation of Sorted Lives. If you don't know Sorted Lives, y'all need to go look for Sorted Lives so you can understand <laughs> our Southern heritage. <laughs> it's really, right. really Accents helps. are already just yes. like front and center. I know. Can I tell you that? I know. It's going to get bad. It's going to get bad. <laughs> as well as a wonderful collaboration between Steve and his husband of Miramar's independent film, Our Very Own. A- amazing, amazing little film with some of the best Hollywood actors around. Sweet, sweet, sweet slice of life film that is just really touching. We're going to put a link in our show notes to it as well. Steve's productions have garnered multiple accolades, including Film Festival Award, Spotlights, as well as the Independent Spirit Award and Prism Award. His genetic and cultural heritage, much like mine, is clearly Southern. He's also a novelist, (laughs) right? Got a lot to say as Southerners. His debut novel, Walking on Electric Air, was published in 2010. He also writes the classic cinema blog, From Beneath the Hollywood Sign, that ultimately led to this podcast. We don't even have time to explore all of his experiences working on TV series that I am obsessed with. So I'm just going to have to... I'm going to have to put Angel and Firefly over to the side, Ah. (laughs) but he's also a graduate of the University of Tennessee, Knoxville with a degree in broadcast journalism. I'm going to have to put aside my desperate need to know everything about your experience working with Tyler Perry. I so want to just dish, but that's like a whole other (laughs) podcast series, I'm sure. That's a whole episode. Exactly. He's also annoyingly humble, unlike me, about all of his accomplishments. So I'm going to engage in some immersion therapy by making him continually uncomfortable with with this very well-earned praise. Welcome, Steve, and thank you for coming today. Thank you, Scott. 
All right. Time for me to take a deep breath. It's my turn. <laughs> you ready, Nan? It's your, I'm ready. It's, you're on the spot. <laughs> we already have Catherine who's in our chat. And if I'm looking over here, it's because I'm looking at our chat and she's like, oh my God, is that Nan McNamara, the voice actor? <laughs> like, oh. Yes. And Catherine oh. does voice acting as well. So we have some fans in the chat. So yes, everyone, please welcome Nan McNamara to the show. She is a powerhouse force both behind the curtain and behind the microphone, as well as in front of the camera. Armed with a theater degree from St. Cloud State University, Nan has been conquering Hollywood for over two decades with her talents. Nan has graced the sets of high profile network series like Hawaii Five O, Lone Star, Dear White People, Criminal Minds, and Switched at Birth. While a prolific actress, Nan's body of work also includes a growing span of directorial triumphs including Pulitzer-nominated playwright Lee Blessings' A Body of Water, two installments of the Nebrock trilogy, as well as the 1940s Radio Hour and the critically acclaimed production of The Boys Next Door. With credits in fan-favorite video games like Star Wars, The Old Republic, Gears of War, and Final Fantasy, Nan's voice is a siren call for gamers everywhere. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> oh, and did we mention... She's lent her vocal magic to hundreds of TV commercials and voiceovers and absolutely is going to put every other woman to shame in podcasting because of her voice. <laughs> so <laughs> welcome, welcome, man. Thank you guys. Oh, thank you. That was such a lovely introduction. Thank you so much. I know. Sure. Thanks for having us. We're so excited to be here with you guys. Oh, this is great. I have to say just right off the bat that, you know, we, we get a ton of positive feedback from our listeners about the camaraderie and the friendship between Dr. Shiloh and I, and I got to push that right forward on to both of you, the, the friendship and the, the camaraderie and the back and forth in your episodes oh. is just phenomenal. <laughs> it's so fun to listen to. I mean, you know what you're doing, but it's just the wonderful relationship that just brings that extra touch of magic. So tell us a little bit about how the two of you came together. We want your origin story how, I mean, I mean, Steve, I know you were, you were made to do this. Like from the oh. moment you set foot in Hollywood, you started connecting with literally the, the golden royalty of Hollywood that was still around in the eighties. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I some did. that are still here now, but yes. how did this, this particular project happen? Well, you know, Nan and I have been friends for 15, 20 years, mm -hmm. probably through Cameron, you know, through acting, Cameron's directed Nan beautifully in a, in a few plays. And, and, you know, we've been social friends forever. And, and we, you know, we always knew that we both had this passion for old cinema or old Hollywood classic cinema. And, you know, we always talk about that. And then it really came to be after Cam and I got married, Nan and her husband, Lindsay, who's our third partner in this venture, they had us over for a little champagne to toast. And, you know, Lindsay has a really incredible podcast called The Shallow End, which is extremely successful, very funny. So he's sort of the, the podcast king. So, and, you know, and they were just talking about how much they love my blog and old Hollywood. And, and, and Lindsay and Nan were like, well, you know, you should make From Neath the Hollywood Sign a, a, a podcast. I was like, I don't know how to do that. And so I just raised my hand right away and I went, <laughs> I know how you could do it. And I kind of forced myself on him in terms of being his co-host. But we both shared uh, getting, you know, talking about old Hollywood. We both shared that time period when there was no Turner classic movies. Yeah. We spent our weekends on the couch on Saturday afternoon or at night watching movies with our family. And that was really the seed for our love, both of our love yeah. of old Hollywood. And then once we got together and started brainstorming this whole banter thing yeah. that you so lovingly yeah. described, we just realized, oh my gosh, this is this is my brother yeah. from another mother. <laughs> it's Isn't so it the true. best to work on a creative project with one of your best friends? I mean, yes. I, yeah. I just think it's such a gift every year that goes by. Like how, who else gets to do something like this with a close friend? Yeah. Well, yeah. You, you guys have it. I mean, your rapport is amazing. So you, you guys know for sure. It yeah. makes a huge difference to have somebody you love and trust there with you. Yes. In the you know the the trenches of it all. Absolutely, Certainly. and also because 
it's like, you know, it's our creative endeavor as it is for you, but you do find yourself in those moments of it's, it, there's a part that becomes a slog because you've got to generate content and, but you still want it to represent your passion. And I don't know how people do it by themselves. Like I don't mm. like our friends that are one person podcasts is like, how the F do you do that? Because yeah. Yeah. if I didn't have her like kicking my ass halfway across the field every week, I would not be able to they do They don't that. know it's a slog yet. They're only like 29 episodes in. Oh, don't, okay. don't kill it for them yet. <laughs> well, we've talked, we've talked about the tidal wave. You know, because we do you, call it that. That, you know, you, every week that goes by, you know, you've got to have your stuff ready to go. You've got to have that thing uploaded and so yeah it is the, a little bit of a second away. you take a break and you're like ah oh, i've got no, all my promos no, done i've got yeah. everything's done then you turn around like oh shit. Here's the title, yep. wave. Here's the title so. wave we start over yeah 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 it, well it does get into like a real you get into a rhythm which i know you're you'll you'll get there and then it's like we just did that and it's like you know it just happens very quickly yeah. but you know we in la not so confidential when we ended up signing with a media company a couple of years ago, we had to start increasing our content to weekly rather than sort of, are we doing an episode this month? <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> right. we, were, we were kind of by the, by the seat of our pants yeah. before, but we added this element, which was totally Shiloh's idea of a vintage crime that was specifically LA based at least once a month. Then that which was fantastic, by the way. And your Zoot Suit episode is amazing. Yes, yes. Oh my gosh. Thank, thank you. you. We actually did get a lot of feedback on we that did. one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, we love those where you go, you think you know the, the history of something and then you do a deeper dive and a deeper dive. And it's like, yes. oh my gosh, there's so much. So, I mean, I think that between the two of you, there's clearly an encyclopedia of knowledge of old Hollywood, but <laughs> what, tell us, lead us through the process of how you research your episodes, because your episodes cover everything. You've got murder and mayhem <laughs> and scandal and very sweet stories and haunted mm -hmm. Hollywood. You've got all of it, but how do you do your research? You know, it's funny because since we're sort of in our infancy, we're lucky because I have five years worth of blogs that we're, we're culling from right now. They've already been researched, but, you know, so we're basically just taking them, we're freshening them up, we're getting, you know, Nan's point of view on them and we're presenting them. But, you know, as far as the research for the blogs themselves, you know, I, I, it's the Academy Library. That is mm. the holy grail of places for me. You know, I can go, I can do a deep dive in clippings and magazines and newspapers and, you know, and really, really get a, a, a nice insight into somebody or some event, things like that. Also, you know, I have an incredible library, so biographies. I mean, I really, when I do decide to take on a subject, I, I go pretty deep and, you know, it usually takes me probably a, a month or so just to do the research before I ever even, you know, write the first word on a blog. So, and I think that'll probably be our research technique as we move forward into new territory mm -hmm. for the podcast. Can you explain what the Academy Library is for oh, our viewers? Is it physical? Is it virtual? Is it yeah, both? Yeah, it's it's lit it, what's well, both, but it's the Margaret Herrick Library on La Cienega, and it's you know associated with the Academy. And anybody can go there. You just have to make a reservation online. They have the most amazing things there. You can look at um, it's unreal. Know, oh, you! I'm sure you've been there, Scott. But, yeah, you know old scripts or you know old um, movie posts, magazine. like the hand painted movie posters that are over a yes. hundred years old thank All god they're that, still preserved you know, yeah the, the original press releases that came out from the studios studio notes uh, you know it, it's a treasure trove of research for anybody interested in hollywood or entertainment or things like that and steve has even gone so far in one of the stories that uh, we might touch on today to call up the lapd and ask for old uh, records to verify okay. to verify stories I, um, do, I do do that quite a bit I'll, I'll get you know the information act i'll go and ask to see the police files on on certain crimes and things like that which always, always help oh my gosh we've got a museum tour to take him on take both <laughs> yeah. of them on I the know. sheriff's department museum was like off the hook yeah yeah oh, wow. or the lapd museum that one yeah. is much more Always accessible love to do that. those <laughs> are fantastic but yeah scott and i did that when we covered marion parker's death the child that was kidnapped and held for ransom and ultimately yes. killed we, they the sheriff's department took us to go look at some of the autopsy photographs and oh, we're down wow. there and they're like oh by the way where that photo was taken of her deceased on that table this is where the coroner used to work the room we're in right now and like we're like what <laughs> what 
what's happening. Oh, wow. Yeah. Mm. It's, it's, a, it's a ride, it yeah. Wild. It was wild. Yeah. yeah. You know, I think it's it can be daunting for us because there are people like you out there that know so much about this that just, we have wonderful listeners that will do an episode after all our research and they're sending us more notes and more oh, knowledge yes. that's oh, probably yes. just coming out of their brains. <laughs> oh my gosh. And our, our, our listener, John. Yep. Yeah. Unbelievable source of information. <laughs> like if, if he's actually a real person, he may be an AI. Yeah. We, we think he's an AI, AI at this point. We, we have a couple of Johns ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> probably, probably, but their brains just work in great ways yes. to be able to put all of this research together and, and, kind and of... God forbid you should miss a date. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. Our, but our, our folks are incredibly kind because yes. we're, we're kind of like, okay, we dip our toe into this once a month. Yes. And um, <laughs> we're having fun with it, but we certainly know there are other experts out there such as yourselves. So what, what have been your, your 29 episodes in, is that correct? Yes. Our 30th drops on Sunday. Oh my gosh. Ooh. And they, do you, you put them out once a week yeah, or, we did. okay. We did. Okay. Yeah. So what have been some of your favorites so far? Oh, there's so many good ones we <laughs> love, but you know, the one that pops to mind and we were talking about this earlier and, and you know, it's very personal for me. And on, I think our episode number four, we did a piece about Beechwood Canyon in Hollywood and all the, the crazy murders and mayhem and mysteries of Beechwood mm -hmm. Canyon. You know, it's so, so good. Much happened there. Oh, thank you, Scott. And, you know, including course, the cult. I didn't realize you you talk yes. about the cult that was there in 1912, I think. Yes. And I had to go look it up because I was yes. like, shoot, well, we didn't know about this one. You know, a, a, one thing that people don't realize is the people that actually own the land for Beechwood Canyon, they were kind of religious fanatics. So if you had a religion, regardless of whether it was legit or not, they would sell you land because they wanted Beechwood Canyon to become this sort of religious uh, utopia. And that's why, you know, the the Logican people moved in and why, you know, all these different religious movements moved into Beechwood Canyon. So it's interesting. But the the part that I wanted to talk about a little bit was there was also a famous love triangle murder in Beechwood Canyon. And it was the actor Paul Kelly, which you may not know his name, but I guarantee you both will know his face. He was in like 400 films. He ended up winning a Tony in 1948, I think, for Command Decision. He was this big, strapping, six foot tall, broad shouldered, square jawed, good looking leading man. He kind of went gray prematurely, so he was able to play cops, but he also could play the statistic bad guy like nobody's business. <laughs> but he lived two doors down from where I live right now. <laughs> that wild yeah his house oh was, and i've always heard about the paul kelly house the paul kelly house and you know if you look at it now it's painted pink and green and the neighbors are lovely they're these hippie people that have like a you know a garden collective and you know it, it's so different from sure what it was when paul kelly lived there but you know paul was this uh, he was actually the first child star on broadway he was master paul kelly they, was his name they, did, oh. they, called, they called him, him master, master paul kelly you know and he really became a, a a very popular child actor in early movies you know early broadway he moved to la in the 1920s some of the first people he met in the mid 20s when he moved here it was a married couple named ray raymond who was a comedian and his wife dorothy mckay who was a dramatic actress. They were his neighbors. They had a four-year-old daughter named Valerie and they all hung out together and they were the partying kind. I mean, they were heavy <laughs> drinkers. They were socializers. I mean, they were rough and rowdy. Well, it was fun until it wasn't. Always. <laughs> and I think Ray's drinking got so bad that Dorothy turned to Paul Kelly kind of for some help and some advice. And, and he was happy to help. He was very happy to help. <laughs> got well, it. Well, happy to step turned, in there. That happy turned into a big love affair. So you had this big love triangle going on in Beechwood Canyon. So of course, Ray gets sober enough to figure out that his wife is now seeing his best friend, Paul Kelly. He confronts Paul and says, you know, I want you to come to my house and we're going to duke it out man to man. So Paul Kelly goes over to Ray Raymond's house and he lived on Cherimoya, which was close by. And they actually, you know, there, there's a big confrontation. And then Paul Kelly basically smashes Ray Raymond's head into a wall. Paul Kelly being much larger man than, yes. than Ray wow. Raymond. Yeah. Like, like Paul Kelly's a, you know, strapping six footer and, you know, Ray Raymond's like this five foot seven, 
you know, 150 pound guy. Well, he did it in front of their maid and the four year old daughter, which was, you know, terrible in and of itself that the daughter saw this. But, you know, so Paul leaves, Dorothy McKay comes home. She realizes what's happened. She puts her husband to bed. She gives him an aspirin and says, it'll be all right. <laughs> okay. Well, it wasn't all right because uh, Ray Raymond ended up dying from brain hemorrhages from the attack. Mm. Of course, the police are get involved and, you know, Dorothy tries to lie about it. She says that, you know, he died in his sleep of natural causes, but then the maid says, no, that's not what happened. And, you know, so then there's this big trial. And the trial was one of those great sensational trials that, you know, we all hear about from that era, you know, when trials were almost like entertainment, which mm -hmm. I guess they still are. I mean, think about yeah, it. Yeah, that um, hasn't yeah. changed much. It. Yeah. So, but, you know, in the trial, well, first of all, they, the, Paul Kelly tried to present it as it, it was a duel. So, you know, it wasn't me just smashing this poor guy's head in. It was just a duel. So it just, he was the unfortunate loser of the duel which, you know, wasn't exactly the case. And then he also tried to deny that there was a relationship between him and Dorothy, which I love because they subpoenaed his houseboy. The houseboy gets on the stand and says, we well, you know, actually, I used to serve you and Dorothy in bed a lot when you were hungover. You always ask for aspirin and Alka-Seltzer. So uh, yeah, maybe there was a relationship. Yeah. So that affair <laughs> comes out and this is not good for the two of them and their yeah. innocence. Yes, exactly. And so-, so you oh, also said you also have a really great anecdote about how she presented on the witness stand that I would well, love for you to recount. This is my favorite. I think this is probably what did her in because, you know, she was so flippant and, and so above it all on the witness stand. She basically said something that, you know, the, you know, conventions of the modern world don't really apply to people like her and Paul because they were much more sophisticated. So right. we should just let this thing be swept under the rug and go about our day. So didn't go over well with the jury, as no. you can imagine. You know, he was sentenced to one to 10 years for, you know, the attack. She was sentenced to, I think, two years for, you know, covering up the crime. But in fact, he got out after two years. She had already gotten out after less than a year. And they got back to business. I mean, it did not stop their careers no. one bit, which is Isn't fascinating. that fascinating? That's yes. fascinating because you, mm. a scandal at that level could completely ruin someone's career and that yet they were able to come back. What do you attribute that to? Do you think it was part of their publicity machine or their star power? What, how did you that know, happen? I think it was the fact that people viewed real life crime as entertainment back then. You know, if you if you really think about it, I think it was just a, a continuation of what they saw on the movie screen. Oh, now I'm reading it in the newspaper. Oh, that's entertainment. This is mm -hmm. a love triangle. This is a story here. And I think people were very intrigued by it. And I don't think they really condoned what these people did. They just saw them as stars. And, you know, they went on. Dorothy ended up, and this is so interesting, I think, she wrote a play about it and uh, about her time in prison called, I think it was called just Women in Prison. And it was so popular that Warner Brothers picked up the rights to it and made a movie about it called Ladies They Talk About, which I, I love that title. Oh, yeah. Ladies They Talk About, which starred Barbara Stanwyck. You know, and Paul got back to work. He was, you know, prolific, prolific actor. He appeared in, you know, so many great things. You know, Public Hero Number 1, he was in that. He was in the Roaring Twenties with James Cagney and Humphrey Bogart. He was in, he even played General Custer in Wyoming in 1940, which is interesting. So, you know, it didn't in his, it didn't hamper his image or his livelihood or his career, which it's, I just find fascinating. And he went on to win, that's when he won the Tony, it was after he was, <gasps> He was <laughs> imprisoned so clearly. Yeah. 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 Didn't then, have you know, much of an effect. <laughs> but the clincher of the story, you know, after all this, you know, Dorothy and Paul, after they get out of prison, they're back together. They get married. He adopts Valerie and changes her name and raises her as, you know, his own daughter. After all this, in like, the, I think it was January of 1940. Dorothy's killed in a car crash. Mm. Oh, wow. So after all that struggle I, I, and going I, through all of that. I don't mean then... to laugh, but you go through so much and then boom, you're just taken out with a car crash. Yeah. So, um, no. well, I will say also there were a lot of car crashes, crashes then because <laughs> no people belt. forget, people forget that. I mean, Steve and I are of the generation growing up in the South where you did your pre-drinking before you went out to the club. <laughs> like you had your drink in your go cup. 
And, and you know, that right. was a thing. And, and even right. before that, that's like 70s and 80s. And so yeah. before that, the 40s, the, they're driving these three ton cars yeah. completely south through I mean, canyons, alcohol, like, through canyons, <laughs> yeah, like through hairpin canyons. turns. Yeah. 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 And I'm sure, you know, little Valerie never got any therapy for seeing her stepdad <laughs> murder her dad in front of I, her. I'm sure that she didn't. You know, but but Valerie, she ended up changing her name to, I think, Mimi Kelly. She became an actress very, very briefly. And she ended up married to the actor Richard Boone, which is interesting. Huh. So, oh, yeah. wow. Yeah. So, Steve, did you go and like knock on your neighbor's door and be like, hey, I have this wild story to tell you about your house? <laughs> the funny thing is, is, is I know those neighbors pretty well. And uh -huh. I told them about the story. They had no idea that Paul Kelly lived in their house. So now they've gotten really fascinated by it. So, you know, oh, they're cool. pulling up old newspaper articles. And so it was kind of fun to share this with them that they live in the Paul Kelly house. Yep. That is really cool. Oh, my gosh. What a... Benedict Canyon. I mean, or Beachwood. no, Beechwood Canyon. I'm sorry. <laughs> Different Canyon with a B. That, that's another episode. Yeah, oh, yeah. no Benedict. kidding. <laughs> all the can cold water, Benedict, yeah. all the canyons have their own personality. Which one is yeah, underneath right. mud right now? Because I think that's Beechwood. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Nan, any that stick out to you is kind of your fave so far? Yeah. I mean, there's a there's a woman by the name of Anne Revere, who's an actress that you probably, again, would recognize her face, but but don't necessarily know her name. And she had at the height of her career, 1947 was a banner year for her. She was in the um, Academy Award winning film Gentleman's Agreement with Gregory Peck. She plays his mother. That film, you know, went on to, you know, great acclaim. And we still think of it now as, as a classic film about anti-Semitism. And unfortunately, after reaching this peak in her career, she fell victim to the blacklist in Hollywood. And that was generated by the House on Un-American Activities Committee. And what's equally sad and sort of ironic about it is that Anne Revere was actually a descendant of Paul Revere. Oh, wow. So, is that irony wow. maybe? Yeah. <laughs> the My fact, goodness. Yeah. The fact that she was, you know, accused of this, wrongly accused, but she was a wonderful actress trained in the theater. She didn't really have much success until her 30s. She actually starred on Broadway in the original production of Children's Hour by Lillian Hellman. And that garnered her the attention of Hollywood. And she went to Hollywood. She made one film. She saw the film, saw herself on the big screen and bought a one-way ticket back to Broadway, <laughs> back to New York, because she didn't like what she saw. Wow. But ultimately, she did have a wonderful film career. And unfortunately, in 1951, she was named by Lee J. Cobb, another fellow actor, yeah. And who was, who was a friend of hers, a really good friend of hers. And I think he just cracked under the pressure because mm -hmm. when you went before the committee, you either you had to declare that you were not a communist. But not only that, they expected you to name names. And if yeah. you didn't, they would still run your career. So it was a no win situation. for yeah. him. It, it was really, really pretty awful. They a produced... dark time, really a dark a, a, another Very... episode and a yes. dark time in America, you know, yeah. just setting people on each other that we expect those stories in, in other countries like, oh, that doesn't happen yeah. here. That happens yeah. other places. Yeah. And it absolutely did happen here and ruin yeah. people's lives. Yeah. And that committee we in doing our research on it, that committee actually was only disbanded. And I believe it was 1974. So the fact yeah. that it still continued even after the, the tragedy of all these careers yeah. and lives being ruined. I mean, when she was on the stand, she was a, a, her a fake communist ID card was essentially placed in front of her with her name typed on it, no signature. And she knew then that it was, the game was up. She was, wow. even though she wasn't a communist, she was going to be accused. And so she left knowing her career was over. She went back to Broadway. Um, well, she didn't go back to Broadway. She went back to New York and really did anything she could with her wonderful husband to act to keep her acting chops sharp. She was doing amateur productions. She was doing off, off, off Broadway until finally Lillian Hellman, who had helped her in the beginning of her career with the Children's Hour, invited her to be a part of Toys in the Attic. And so she was cast in Toys in the Attic in a pretty substantial supporting role. And the good news is that she went on to win the Tony Award for that for that show. 
And eventually, 10 years after that, went back to Hollywood and did more film and more television, but she never reached the height that she had in, in 1947. And we lost almost over 20 years of what could have been an amazing career in mm -hmm. film. And you can you can see her now and we can remember her wonderful performances. Thank God. But it's really sad to think yeah. about what we missed yeah. out on. Yeah. Sure. I mean, it's almost like yeah. when she didn't like, you know, seeing herself on the big screen, like that was a premonition. <laughs> it's like how <laughs> how Hollywood was going to go the for her. I know. <laughs> but, you know and what I, I loved about her is for a while, I mean, she was sort of considered America's mother. Mm -hmm. I mean, she was so great. She won an Oscar for National Velvet playing Elizabeth Taylor's mother. Oh, she's yeah. Jennifer Jones' mother in the song of Bernadette. And, and she's Gregory Peck's Gregory mother. Peck's mother. So she was the epitome of what we think of as the American mom and apple pie. And then this horrible thing happens to her. And I just remember one thing I just add to the story sure. is that after she you know, realized that she was being set up to be you know brought down, she knew on the stand she had three choices. She could, you know, basically plead the fifth. She could basically say, no, I'm not associated with the Communist Party and hear the names because they expected mm. names. Or she could say, up yours and walk out. And so she knew that her career would be over regardless. So she, you know, she pleaded the fifth. Her career was over. And, you know, they, they just had you in such a corner yeah. in these, these horrible monkey trials. I mean, they were just as bad that you, you had no choice. Yeah. which is so frustrating. And, and you know, we should all re-examine what's going on now and think about it as we look back. On Absolutely. It's the same kind of drive for power. Yes. I mean, just to slip into sort of the subject matter of what our show is about is the, that narcissism that drives yeah. someone into politics to, to find their little bit of power. And then, you know, a wildly incompetent individual rises to power on yeah. that one thread that they have. And the the House on Un-American Committees is a perfect example of that. Yeah, they have, we we'll have, have to work on a collaborative episode at some point yeah, about that and that. build that on that. Because yeah, talk about- a, Senator a, McCarthy and we had that former president. <laughs> he who shall not be named. He shall not be named. <laughs> yeah. So it, it's interesting, you know, kind of talking about that. Scott and I have to, at times- put topics aside because we decide not to do them for various reasons. I mean, it can be too close to home for our mm -hmm. jobs. It can be just feels like a topic that maybe people aren't ready for a clinical take on yet. Just feels a little bit too sensitive. Feels like it's been glorified too much. Maybe there's nothing new we can bring to it. Total random question, but do you guys ever feel like you have certain stories you want to stay away from for your own personal reasons or things that you just don't want to cover on this podcast? I mean, we, we haven't really had that come up yet. Yeah. I think it might at some point. One of the things that we've noticed in working together is that one of us gravitates toward <laughs> sort of the happier, you know, stories, the... <laughs> <laughs> oh, I thought it was going to be the other ending. way around. <laughs> <laughs> well, I always, I, I always gravitate towards stories where somebody is a late bloomer, Okay. That gives me hope. <laughs> and, or somebody who's overcome adversity, someone like Anne Revere, who, you know, yeah. was able to reinvent herself. And me, I want a dead starlet. I want a murder. Check I want a Check mystery. Out. I want it dark. Yeah. <laughs> so we and have there's, come. there's no lack of those stories yeah. in Hollywood. Yes, exactly. Absolutely. <laughs> oh my gosh. I mean, really the first 29 episodes that we've done, I think over half of them, some tragedy involves alcohol or drugs. Yeah. Yep. You know, with the one episode we did about, about animals in the industry, that was thankfully the one of the only stories where none of the animals died because they were alcoholics. <laughs> Are you sure? No. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Who can really know, right? Shiloh? I like remember their trainers, that's... their trainers were for full blown yeah. alcoholics, right? <laughs> it's so interesting. I remember years ago when I worked for casting director Allison Jones, who is yeah. So gifted, yeah. just a, a, and she has over the past decades, she has set so many careers yes. in motion yeah. and yeah. absolutely loves actors and roots for actors. And we had a young actor come from the Midwest. And the minute he came into town and, and she saw him in a in like a showcase, it was like 
I'm this guy's going to be in everything I cast. He's fantastic. And she gave him, you know, his first three credits and he was just, you know, he hooked up with a great agent. And then we got the notice one morning, like that he had overdosed, mm-hmm. you know, that he oh. just had never engaged in the use of heroin before. And, oh, you know, it's just oh. like, it was one of those, it was really shocking for me at that time in my life. Like, oh, this is actually a real thing. You know, you'd, we had heard about John Belushi, but even, you know, people starting out can get sucked into that that aspect of entertainment which is yes. frightening dark side yeah and i think just as actors in general they have such they have to have a sensitive skin and and what that can mean is that they're vulnerable to all the trappings that happen in hollywood and all of the things that you know if something doesn't go right it can be the crutch that they lean on and yeah. it's it, you can understand why it can become such a tragic story for so many well right nan and you bring up this in one of the episodes i was just listening to this morning you really are, make a very poignant statement about many of our artists are wounded in their own way and then they bring their wound their wound transmutes into the talent that they share with us on yes. the screen on the stage in music and you know there's a lot to be said for those of us in mental health well as well that like we're wounded healers we come to this because we we yeah. understand the pain that humanity experiences in a way that you know people that are maybe a little bit more blessed don't understand yeah. i love but, that wounded healer that's yeah, great i love that yeah the wounded healer and the wounded artist i think are yeah. both kind of mm-hmm. special you know, Scott, people. we're doing research right now on an episode about Mary Astor and the famous Mary Astor diaries. And one, one thing I just found in the research was, you know, of course, John Barrymore was her first lover who really mm-hmm. taught her everything. And he, he said to her, he said, you know, Mary, until you've lived, until you've had your heart broken, until you've experienced these things, you can't be a good actress. You have to know it and feel it. And I think that sort of prevalent in you know hollywood i think people feel like they have to and they don't and they don't you can act you can use your imagination i mean that's kind of yeah yeah. (laughs) well it's it's very interesting about i mean just to to veer more in that direction for just a second about you know there's there's so much controversy and discussion about the up-and-coming actors in hollywood over the past decade and so many of them are coming from britain or the uk Mm -hmm. and australia and they're like, why are we getting this invasion? And casting directors and producers are going because these are people are, who have training because yeah. they went to RADA. They decided yeah. I'm going to make the four year commitment. I'm going to go to an acting school. I'm going to learn the American accent. They they're raised on American television. So they come in with the best training as opposed to sort of what entertainment has kind of morphed into in the U.S. where it's anybody with an Instagram thinks yeah. that they can, you know. <laughs> Yeah. And then they're yes. just playing a version of themselves and everything. <laughs> yeah. And then have, exactly. you know, and then they don't understand why they're not being given roles with depth. It's like, but I mean, the whole industry has shifted. We could have another episode about that. <laughs> I wanted to ask you before we lose any more time, though, we did a deep dive into Lana Turner and yes. I wanted to, you can be completely honest with us. What did we get right? <laughs> what did we get wrong? Or have, what can you offer on I have, this? I have one prompt for you, Steve, first. Is it Lana Turner? Is it uh, Lana Turner? You know what? It's, I'm going to call Scott out. It's it's Lana. Oh, <gasps> Lana. Lana. I stand corrected. And in fact, I, and, and Nan brought this up. We were talking about this. Uh, she's on, is it Johnny Carson? She's or? on Johnny Carson yes. and Joan Rivers happened to be hosting that night. And she has Lana Turner on and Lana looks absolutely stunning. She's probably in her sixties at that point. And jo- uh, Joan calls her Lana. Oh, and, okay. And Lana reaches over her hand and says, it's Lana. <laughs> wow. So it came right Ooh. out of her mouth, which is the, the best way to get a pronunciation right is when the actual- Good for her for get correcting. Get her a list of burn on... centers for <laughs> Joan. <laughs> well, first of all, before, before we get into you guys, um, I actually got to spend an incredible evening with Lana Turner one time in the early 90s. And 
Yeah. I call her Miss Turner. Okay. Could, oh, yeah, yeah. We're all That's safe what I that. would call yes. her. That's what I would call yes. her. Yeah. 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 Miss Holmes, Miss, Miss. Tom, can you tell us about that night too? By the way, you yeah. can't just yes. like tease that. Yes. <laughs> I know. It is kind of a tease, isn't it? But, you know, I was very, in fact, I call her my fairy godmother. I met Anne Rutherford, the actress from Gone with the Wind, when I was in college. And she said, when you come to Hollywood, look me up. And sure enough, when I moved to Hollywood, I looked her up and she really became my fairy godmother, introduced me to everybody. I mean, I was so, so fortunate. You know, I met Glenn Ford. I met, you know, I met through her, I met Marsha Hunt, who became my other fairy godmother. Oh I gosh. met, you know, Lana Turner. I met Ginger Rogers. I met Ann Miller. I mean, I met them all because she knew I had such an interest in it. She wanted to make sure I met these people. Robert Stack, who became a, a buddy of mine. Elizabeth Scott, so, so many. Joan Leslie, another great friend. But anyway, she ended up, we went to this event together that Lana was going to be at. So she arranged for us to all sit together at the same table. So I had this incredible night with Lana Turner. And also there as Anne's date was a wonderful friend of mine named Al Morley, who he he's a great guy who uh, basically had a movie memorabilia shop on Santa Monica Boulevard next to, what's that? Larry Edmonds. What's that? No, his was called Matinee Idol. And it was next to, what's that great theater, Scott, right on Santa Monica Boulevard? Sergeant the Coast. Steve. The Coast Playhouse. It was right there. Well, he knew Lana was in town, so he had displayed her pictures and posters and books in his window. So he told her about it, and and Lana was like, "Well, let's go see it." <laughs> so oh, sweet. Ann and Al and Lana Turner and I get in Al's car oh, and we drive down Santa Monica Boulevard just so that he can show How her the window. Amazing. And she was oh. amazing. She was really sweet and very engaging and so interested in in me and and it, it, she was a yeah, she was pretty special. Well, and just taking that and moving into the Stumpinato um murder we were both incredibly impressed. A plus. Yeah. You guys get an A plus. A plus. Yes. Yeah. Deep. I Thank mean, that you. was a deep dive. Yeah. And from everything that we've yeah. read and researched, you guys got it all right. We have thoughts about the night and and share. Some Share. Say more. Say more. Well, Well, first of all, thank you because, (laughs) you know, if you only do it because I want to hear your hear your thoughts, but I think you touched on something that is so important to us as creators is that when we go looking for information, if you only look at the first two pages of Google Scholar or Wikipedia or something, you only get the surface, and we found like, oh, there's all this contradictory information mm-hmm. about yes. that particular crime there were wildly different stories yes. so thank thank goodness for newspapers.com which has been an incredible yes. treasure trove yes. of information yes. but and thank you for that so let us know what so please well, can i just say yeah. your your research was impeccable the, the research that you guys did like i love the fact that you guys um, go to very reliable sources. You don't just say, oh, on Wikipedia, it says, yes. I love <laughs> you guys for that. Yeah. Because so Thank many you. people in journalism today do that. And it's a real pet peeve of mine. Yeah. And some yeah. people have even stolen some of Steve's things. I'm just, sure. Yeah. Because he's so good at, at researching. But I'm really curious to read the Casey Sherman book that yeah. you guys both mentioned. One of the things that I was not able to read it you know, before today but one of the things that it looks like he talks about is the fact that mickey cohen was really the one that was extorting or perhaps threatening lana turner so that was an interesting thing we I'd, I'd always heard of it as yes he worked for mickey cohen mm-hmm. but stampanato was the guy that was really threatening her and i and perhaps it was both but if mickey cohen is threatening your family that has more of a to me, a weight and pressure than just Stompanato. But the other thing that I, in doing some research on it for for the previous episode that we talked about with Lana Turner is Cheryl Crane herself, when she was interviewed by CNN in this this Larry King interview, which I, I you guys, I don't know if you've seen that one, but she herself does say about her mother that her mother was not a mommy dearest mother. Her mother was certainly had to be absent because of work, but from everything I've read and, and, and heard her say, she was a good mother. And she goes on to say that if she had done it, and this is a quote from her, she would, she would never have let that happen. And if it were true, I wouldn't be sitting here saying, yes, it's true. I killed someone if it wasn't true. So it was two points Hmm. that she made one 
my mom would never allow me to take the fall. Got it. Yeah. And number two, if that had happened, she's gone now. And I would not be sitting here and saying to you to, to this day that I, that I did it. Sure. Um, but you also have some insight into Lana oh. in terms of just <laughs> this idea that she's not a good mother, or that she's yes. a floozy and. You know, and, and it goes back to Anne Rutherford and, and, you know, Lana and Anne knew each other from, you know, the thirties, they did dancing co-ed together and, and these glamour girls together. They've been close, close friends for years. And Anne told me one time, she said, I, you know, I get so frustrated with people's opinion of, of Lana. You know, they think she's easy and loose and she dates around and she's this hussy and, you know, all of this. She said, you know, it's the opposite. Lana is actually very old fashioned. And, you know, she is under the belief that, you know, if you want to sleep with Lana, yeah. you have to marry Lana, right. which is probably why she sense. was married so many times. It totally yeah. makes sense. Sure. Yeah, she Heck. was a good girl and, yeah. and a good mother. Uh, uh, well, and she was an extremely good mother and she doesn't get credit for that. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think one of the things that impressed me about what emerged in our research or what I was really, I thought was notable is she really represented that old Hollywood work ethic, especially for women. It's like women had to create their own opportunities at that time. You know, we look at people like Ida Lupino who just jumped yes. from, you know, she's like, I'm not going to stop working. I'm going to be a director and then sort yes. of opened up the floodgates of doors for female directors. Yes. But Lana, I mean, to, to take it into, you know, you know, I'm a marriage and family therapist. I'm a clinical and forensic psychologist. I, the term I use sometimes is that people's radar is a little bit broken. Like their radar needs to be a little bit more finely tuned mm -hmm. in choosing the people that you get pulled into relationships. Many times in relationships, we end up playing out the same family cycle that we grew up with. And we keep thinking, if I do it again with this particular person, it will heal everything in my background. Mm -hmm. yes. And, you know, when I, I'm not saying that that's what was going on for her, but it's not an uncommon occurrence. The other part of it is you start looking at pictures of Johnny Stompanato. That was a good looking dude. <laughs> <laughs> you talk about like a good looking Bad boy. Like not pretty. Like that yeah. was a, that was a, yes. well, and you guys, a masculine about, guy. You guys talk about this so well. It, you know, he was, he went out of his way to ingratiate himself, sending flowers. He wooed her. I mean, he wooed her. Yeah. So you've got a good looking guy. He's got, you know, a lot of money. He's wooing you. You know, yeah. I mean, I think her radar was probably off. Look at Lex Barker, who you guys also uh, sure. mentioned. I mean, sure. that yeah. guy, you know, molested Cheryl. Yeah. And yeah. So, yeah. It's... And once she found out about it, right? Like, it's the accounts of her. Oh, yeah. <laughs> really, you know, threatening his life. Yes. And she essentially she... choosing her daughter, believing her daughter. I was going to say, is... she never questioned Cheryl. I love that. There she always believed Cheryl, which yeah. I don't think was always the case yeah. with other people in with other, other people. situations. Right. right. Yeah. So I just want to re quickly respond. That's just one little sidebar here. We have so much conversation going on in the chat that we have. We've been so <laughs> focused on you guys, which is wonderful. But just for anybody, I, I want to make sure you understand that as a clinician, when I share something like that, just because your radar or your picker is a little bit off doesn't mean you can't retune it. You absolutely yes, can like retune it. it. I'm not yes. saying you have to go to therapy, but all of that can be <laughs> fixed. We just have to like be be kind and soft with ourselves and realize point, you have Scott. choice in relationships you don't have to keep yeah. replaying the same thing yeah. so yeah. you know who i'm talking to out there identifying <laughs> that your picker is broken is half the battle exactly <laughs> it's the first step yes. so what's coming up yeah oh we've got fun stuff coming up we do yeah. we do we have some fun stuff we're uh diving into a couple of themed episodes we've loved doing holiday films halloween films so we're going to do a Mother's Day episode featuring films that you may not be as familiar with, with either good mothers or bad mothers. Bad nice. mothers. She's the good mother. I'm the bad mother. <laughs> Can I make a, oh, please do Straight Jacket. Straight Jacket ah. is one of my favorite, favorite films. I love a... that film, Scott. You know what? Oh that my God. Perfect I love that it. episode, actually. <laughs> and we have some so good fun. ones coming up. Yeah, we do. You know, we, we want to do, you know, an, a, to honor our, our veterans. We want to do a, a you know episode about uh, 
great war movies for mm. Veterans Day, things like love that. We, we definitely, we love a good theme. So yeah. we and want to do that. For this dark guy over here, we're going to be recording uh, an episode very soon on Monday, actually, about the um, actor Robert Walker, yes. who um, tragically died at the age of 31 um, from a broken heart, some say. Mm. Oh. Or some bad drugs from a doctor who might have been trying to kill him because of David O. Selznick. But oops, yeah, <laughs> did, did I say that? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, well, I wanted I I wanted to say also the the I was jumping around in all of your episodes, and the last one, the most recent before we started today, that I was listening to was the Halloween episode, and I am I am evangelical about the movie The Innocents. I oh, think it is yeah. one of the greatest adaptations yes. for for those of us that like suspenseful horror psychological horror especially just that that question if you if there's a if you give me a main character where we're not sure of their experience are they yes, going crazy, crazy. is yeah. it really yeah. happening and that that one is a perfect example i'm so glad that you touched on it i thought it was just to this day it creeps me out it is, it is very a creepy, creepy creepy movie yeah you don't want to watch that one alone <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I've listened mostly to the first half of your catalog. So I went on today to see how many episodes you guys are up to. And I realized the most recent one is golden era stars in seventies disaster films. Yes. <laughs> I am a disaster film oh, nut. Yes. Like oh, earthquake is earthquake is totally in my top 10 oh, for sure. I love and earthquake. And I, well, you know, I don't know if you guys know this, but Ava Gardner is sort of our patron saint of our show. Yeah, she's oh, up on our wall. We actually have her up okay. on the wall. We we made her our patron saint, and I love of course, that. she's so good in Earthquake, so oh, good bad. <laughs> I know, I know, so good bad. But that's that's the beauty of it, and that's the beauty of most disaster films, yeah. even to today, is the <laughs> hokiness of them. But that one is just kind of takes the cake, and being in Los Angeles is. Perfect. Yes, yes. <laughs> I well, can't look, wait to I, listen. I really hope that thank again. I want to thank you guys for coming on today, for taking the time to prep for this and and speak with us and speak to our audience. I would. I'm just going to put this out there and actually going to. I'm going to put everybody on the spot by streaming it rather than just in chat or email. <laughs> is that please? Let's figure out a way to collaborate. I think we, we need to do a live event. I think yeah. we really do. In we because be really I was fun. telling Nan when we spoke on the phone. We know a handful of other podcasters that are all based about L.A. proper. We've got Holly Weird Paranormal. We've got L.A. Meekly. We had a great event with them last year. We got to do it again with you guys. It would Let's just it. be a blast. We'd love it. We'd love it. Yeah. Yes. Wonderful. Yay. It's a date. All right. It's a date. <laughs> oh, my god. So gosh. where can people find you? Website, social media, whatever you want to put out there. Our handle for social media is at from beneath the Hollywood sign. And the website is also from beneath the Hollywood And Excellent. we have a YouTube channel as well that isn't just the podcast, but it has photographs of the films and the stars and the people that we're talking about. And eventually it'll be the two of us on yeah. video great. and then interspersing with, with uh, photos. And, you know, people can always email us too. We, we get lots of great emails, which I love. And, and that's at info at from beneath the Hollywood sign.com. Perfect. Thank you guys for your time. This was so fun. I told Scott, I'm like, I need to hear all of Steve's stories about stuff, not even related to what we're talking about. Today. Oh my God. I'm so sorry. I have to hold you. I have to keep you on for another few minutes. Sure. So, so this, thank you Shiloh for bringing this up, for reminding me, but first of all, like y'all are only seeing like one fraction of Steve's life because he's <laughs> married to someone that I've known for literally decades Yes, between the two of them. They, you just don't understand what a comedy routine the two of them are. I mean, <laughs> it's just unbelievable. They're both Southerners. Cameron Watson is a gifted, gifted actor, gifted director, writer. He's a quadruple quintuple threat, but <laughs> I remember being <laughs> at your house one night you weren't there because you were handling one of these things, which are autograph fairs. And I'm not sure if everybody with, in our with audience Al Morley. really knows what they are. Can you tell us about that? Oh. And can you tell us about the scandal with the little rascal? Oh, oh my God. I can't believe you remember that. I <laughs> tell everybody this story because I think oh it's the God. best ever. It's it's actually, yeah. it's true crime. It's well, actually you know, true crime. My dear friend, Al Morley, who I met, 
you know, who was Ann Rutherford's date the night I met Lana Turner, who had the memorabilia show, he would always go to these celebrity autograph signing events. And it's basically every celebrity you've ever heard of or not, or not <laughs> show, shows up like this, one episode of star Trek. Or, you're, you're, yeah. I mean, there's people, if you did one episode of star Trek, you can make a living just doing these shows. Yeah. You know, you charge for your autograph. There's pictures there. You're, at these, at, a desk. you're at these card tables and people come up and sign things. It, I find it a little distasteful and creepy, but that's just me, but I get it. I know you want to meet people, but I was helping Al do one because Al was elderly and I would kind of help him load in and things like that. There was a big controversy because the actor who played Stymie, Stymie Beard in The, the Little Rascals was there. And I guess somebody Googled that, that the real Stymie had died like years ago. <laughs> so this was an imposter Stymie. Stop it. Who had shown up at this autograph show. Oh my God. I mean, that's kind of genius. Guards were brought out. Uh, you know, there was an uproar. It was palpable in the convention hall. You knew there's a fake Stymie in the house. <laughs> the best part, though, was being with Cameron as you were texting him and just like things were, oh my God, there's a scandal. <laughs> <laughs> stymie is fake i mean it's like, it was just wonderful and also cameron i mean there's I, for those that don't know about the phenomenon of these autograph shows it really does support some of our older actors that maybe yeah. didn't yes. didn't prepare or weren't yeah. able to pre prepare for living as long as they have and it actually has a really great send up on Shit's creek in the series Shit's creek yes. they yes. You know, the, the the Rose family is really down financially. They've lost everything. And then about three seasons in, Moira realizes she can go to an autograph signing and make buck. And she absolutely does. But one of the things, because Cameron is also, your husband is a very wonderful physical comedian. And he said, he was talking about how interesting it is to go to them, but also how it is a little bit disturbing because you he goes, you, he's watching people walk past these actors' tables and that people are trying to figure out if they know the person. Oh. Yes. So, like, they're sitting there and they're looking at the name. And they're trying to be subtle about looking, it, at least uh, as much yeah. as they can. Yeah. Uh, there's not a lot of room for subtlety, though, when yeah. you're trying to remember. So, it's, but, oh, you know, boy. hey, I'm glad it works. It's like Comic-Con for, you I know. know. And, you know, I, I, sh crowd. I shouldn't knock it because it, it is a beautiful thing in that it, it gives fans a chance to meet their heroes. And, and, right. and so I, I I take back it. Maybe it's not as creepy as I think. I know it's creepy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow. Thank you for sharing that with us. We appreciate yeah. it. And I wanted to hear about it. Aww. I've been telling Scott <laughs> this because he's been like hyping it up. And someone in the chat said, I've never seen Scott so excited. <laughs> 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 but People are posting your website there. People are saying, gee, thanks for another podcast that I absolutely have to listen to now. Oh, <laughs> so thank you. Guys. Um, we have thank some you. folks that are really looking forward to listening to you guys. So we hope there's more teaming up in the future. We would love it. We, we would, would love, love it. it. Yes. Very good. Well, thank so, you so much. And let me sign out with this. If the golden era of old Hollywood is your thing, this podcast is for you. If you want Tyrone Power instead of Tom Hardy, Jennifer Jones instead of Jennifer Lawrence, or Robert Mitchum rather than Robert Pattinson, then From Beneath the Hollywood Sign is the gin joint for you. Mm -hmm. Please, we are urging you, go and subscribe to this wonderful show wherever you find your podcasts, and we're going to beg them to come back and be guests on our shows again. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Anytime. Thank you. Anytime. Thanks it was so a pleasure. Much, you guys. You're, you're both a, yes, it's a pleasure. You're both wonderful. <laughs> yes. Thanks. Have a good night, everyone. Good night, folks. Bye bye. We'll see you next bye. time. Bye bye. 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 We sincerely thank you for spending some time with us today. LA Not So Confidential is part of the Crawl Space Media Network in partnership with Glassbox Media. Each episode is hosted, produced, and written by Dr. Scott and Dr. Shiloh. Our post-production editing and sweetening magic is handled by the multi-talented Jason Usry of Ear Cult Productions. 
The LA Not So Confidential theme entitled Cool Vibes Film Noir is composed and performed by the talented Kevin McLeod. He graciously allows us to use his music via a Creative Commons attribution license. And you can check out all of Kevin's amazing work on YouTube. All of the resources for each episode can be found on our website at la-not-so-confidential.com. You can find us on Instagram at LA Not So Podcast, on Twitter at LA Not So Pod, and on Facebook at LA Not So Confidential. Media inquiries and bookings are scheduled at alienistentertainment at gmail.com. Please join us each month on Saturdays at 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time for a live streaming and very interactive broadcast on YouTube entitled Behind the Couch. Stay tuned to all of our social media for our live streaming scheduling announcements. Subscribe to LA Not So Confidential so you never miss a new episode. And lastly, we'd be honored if you joined our Patreon at patreon.com slash LA Not So Podcast. With a subscription, you get an ad-free listening experience and you'll be the first notified about upcoming live events, social gatherings, and super cool swag coming your way. Thanks for listening and join in with us next time on LA Not So Confidential. Bye, folks. <laughs>